there's a takeaway from this ridiculous, stupid season, it's that the Miami Heat are the most unpredictable mess in the NBA. 48 hours after beating all-star Joel Embiid in the 76ers in Philadelphia, they return to Miami and get blown out by the same Sixers without Embiid. There are no answers for what went wrong because it seems like it's something new every game, but the shooting, the bench, and even Miami's top 10 defense were all horrendous. What has to happen for the team to show any consistency? We break it all down in today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are Locked On Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked on Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. I'm Wes Goldberg here with David Ramil. However, you might be tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. All right, so after a brief uh, reprieve, we'll call it, Miami's inability to make threes returned on Wednesday night in a big way. Despite getting a break when Joel Embiid was ruled out with a sore foot, the Heat lost to the 76ers tonight, 119-96, to to begin an important six-game homestand. We're going to hand out blame pie. We're going to get to some listener questions. Some people are, re- are ready to just blow this thing up after this loss. Um, there wasn't really anything to feel good about for the Heat in this one. Uh, the main issue remained the three-point shooting. After making 40% of their threes in that win in Philly on Monday, which you and I called the best win of the season, yeah. the Heat tonight missed 21 of their 28 three-point attempts, including 13 in a row. They had a period early. They had two different long scoreless stretches in the game, one that lasted over six minutes long and another one that lasted almost four minutes. The Heat have now shot worse than 30% in three of their last five games and have lost five of their last six as they continue to make it harder for themselves to get good playoff positioning. Uh, But the story of the game to me, David, is that I'm just – I'm so tired of watching this team miss three-pointers and just brick their way into losses. They're not going to go undefeated, right? They're not going to go 82-0. Right. Uh, I get that. But if they're going to lose, like, just maybe try doing it in a different way just to make things a little <laughs> bit more exciting. Because I am, I am drained just watching this team. I don't even know if it's a good team. That's my biggest problem. It makes this hard... The analysis of this team difficult because sometimes it looks like tonight everything was bad. They were a bad team tonight. But like bigger picture, sometimes I'm like, is this a good team that just misses shots or is this a bad team? I don't even know anymore. I don't think I don't think anybody's been more optimistic about the season than I have because I've seen glimpses similar to what we saw in Monday in terms of this team capable of beating anybody. Eric Spolster talked about that after the game, that we've seen this team be so good that they are capable of challenging even the best competitors, most you know, the best contenders in this league. And then you get a game like tonight when they look the exact opposite end of that spectrum. They're horrific to watch. And it's just, it's inexplicable. The shots are still there. They're still taking those shots. And they're wide open on so many occasions, similarly to what we saw against uh, Charlotte on Saturday and Milwaukee on Friday. It's just there seems to be some kind of level of inconsistency, a psychological one. I don't think it's anything schematic, and I don't know if you can just blame it on personnel because this is the same personnel that you've had all season, and it's basically the same personnel you had last year too when they were, as you said earlier, the best shooting team in the NBA. So there has to be something between the ears, and I know that seems so cliche or overly simplistic, whatever terminology you want to call it, but I just can't help but shake that idea that they just think these shots are going to fall Unlike on Monday when they hit their first couple of shots and you could see a little bit of a confidence, a little swerve to them that maybe was absolutely missing today. I I don't know. Uh, You know, Gabe Vincent struggled. Tyler Hero struggled. And that's basically the sum of tonight's game is that your backcourt cannot go 6 of 26 from the field and miss almost every three-point opportunity available to them. A lot of those wide-open shots. So I don't know if it's a between-the-ears thing, big picture, but tonight it felt like it was. They only took 28 threes, and you can't really blame them because they couldn't make any of them. So sure, I guess I'd thought. stop taking them, too. But even early in the game, when it wasn't clear that this team was going to stink it up from three-point range this way, it it just felt like they they weren't quick with their decision-making on the perimeter, right? Like, their, their, their strategy tonight against Philadelphia, that, again, was without Joel Embiid. So they were playing P.J. Tucker, and they were small. And so yeah. Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, I thought, did an okay job of hunting their mismatches. Sure. Like, hey, get this guy in a switch, whether it's Tyrese Maxey or DeAnthony Melton or whatever smaller player. Let's get him in the switch. Let's attack him in the post. Let's get into the paint. Let's do Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo things. Right. 
But then they would kick out to the perimeter, and so often, like the players would just hesitate to shoot. And I was just, and so yeah, tonight it did feel like a between the ears thing to me. I just like, where's the quick decision making? Where's that confidence? I didn't see a single confident three taken all day, all night tonight. Um, you look at what they did from an efficiency standpoint. We already talked about it. They were bad, twenty five percent from three point range. When you include volume, the fact that they only took twenty eight three pointers. So when you include the volume portion of it. The only game where they shot worse than this was when they went 4 of 20 in Dallas on January 20th. They shot 20% on 23s. That was the only game when you incorporate the volume part of this that they had a worse three-point shooting night. So it's, an, it's this is even an aberration for this Miami Heat team that has gone from best three-point shooting team in the league last year to one of the worst this year. Even this was an aberration. There's still no excuse for it. And, like, it... Every night, it just seems like, okay, if the shots go in like they did in Philly on Monday, right. they have a chance. They win games. Everybody's feeling great. People are smiling and laughing and all these things. And then you get a game like this, and, you and you know, you, you, we were both in the post-game locker room. We talked to Spo and Bam after the game and all these things, and it's just dejection. It's just what there's nothing we can do. It's just the vibes are so lost. And, and like, I'll, I'll say this over and over again, but... There's nothing like taking the wind out of a sail. There's nothing like like poor three point shooting that could take the wind out of a sail faster uh, in the NBA. Yeah, I, I mean, after Monday's game, when it was such a high point for the season, you've got Jimmy really cocky, having these Jordan esque like shots on the floor. You've got big games, blocks from Cody Zeller, Bam at a bio, clutch game, but you're getting your shooting, you're getting right, and, and you, you're fixing everything that's been wrong with the season. And maybe it's all in one night. But then you go the next day, you have to be able to build on that. That was the, the, the point that you and I made after that, yeah. that game was, is this the launching point for the regular seat for the we, rest and, of the regular and, season? And we were both like, I don't know. Yeah. Because we have no idea. And, and, and Spo said this after the game. He was like, the sustainability part is what they can't wrap their hands around. And when you talk about what a great NBA player is, an all-star, what do, you, what do people always say? All-stars are the players that do it every night. It's not about the highs. It's not about the 40-point games. It's about the consistency that they go out with every single night. And that's what the difference between a streaky shooter or a streaky player, a role player who can burst open for, for any given night versus an all-star. And you can apply the same logic to basketball teams more than just players. The good teams do it every single night or most every night. Any team can win games. The Houston Rockets and the San Antonio Spurs and the Charlotte Hornets have won games this year. Yeah. The Heat aren't that bad, but this idea of, hey, this is a good team that just can't make shots, no. This is a mediocre team that more often than not does not make shots. And if you look at the fact if you look at how poorly they're shooting shooting the ball this year, it's almost a minor miracle that they're 33 and 30. Like this is not a team that feels like it should be even this good sometimes. You know, you watch this team and you're like, how have they won 33 games? I, I, and sometimes I really don't know. And nights like this, it, it kind of feels that way. So I, I, I'm just... Were they seven games over 500 at one point? They were. And they were also like, what, five games under 500 at one point, too? I mean, this just feels like a mediocre basketball team. It's all over the place. It's, it's really hard to sell. I like, I, I, I mean, like, it's not the kind of analysis you want. And we could break it in now. How much of, how much of Embiid's absence played a role in tonight's three-point shooting? I don't know how much it really did, if anything. Because, again, a lot of those looks, and maybe that's part of it, is that they only wound up taking 20, what, 29 three-point attempts. But they were mostly wide open looks. I mean, they were moving the ball well, and and I think they had more quick personnel out there, Paul Reed, et cetera, guys that could close out a little bit more effectively than having you know a big seven footer like Embiid, who's a little bit slow of foot uh, on those closeouts. Maybe that's part of it, but we've seen this recipe before. I, I don't know. I don't know what to you asked. You asked Spo about it, and I thought he gave you a pretty interesting answer. You 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 asked him about how. The having no Joel and Bead for the Sixers tonight might have changed the Heat's approach to this, and and I'll, I'll just let you say he, what he, he yeah. basically. I, I don't know that he had a necessary an answer, but that when it shouldn't have changed their approach, but that they couldn't seize those opportunities, I think was was the main takeaway. Well, he said it, it's not like he said I wouldn't call it an exhale, right? But he used the word exhale, so. Uh, Are they taking their foot it, off the to gas? Me, no, bit? to me it was interesting a little bit because he acknowledged, like when you an, when you ask the question, there was an acknowledgement of Spo, like, yeah, I've also thought about this. I've also thought about how we haven't made the most of these opportunities because you you mentioned the uh, the game a week ago against the Bucks when Giannis right. left early in the game, right. and then obviously tonight without Joel Embiid, those are games that you should win. Those are games that you're supposed to win um, because their the MVP player is out of the game, and so. 
it did feel a little bit like, okay, is there a lack of urgency because those MVPs aren't before. on the other court? Yeah. yeah, and I just, I don't know. I, I, it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg thing to me. Is it like the, the other MVP is more. out, so, you know, is, is it like, are they, yeah, exactly. Are they just, are they up, kind of next man up mentality, and they're all, they're ready for it, and everybody's stepping up, and then the Heat aren't ready for it? Is yeah. it the fact that they can't make any threes early in the game? Because it looked good in the first quarter, and then it looked really bad for the rest of the yeah, game. Yeah, 38 points in the first quarter, and then... <laughs> and then they made a, and then Max Drews year. made a three two minutes into the second quarter, and they didn't make another three until there was two minute, 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter. God awful. They went uh, 25 and a half minutes tonight without a made three-pointer. Really, in a really ugly missed, game. So, Demoralizing yeah. in every degree. Uh, I, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have plenty of blame pie yes. to lay for everybody around uh, That's in the a- following segment. But before we do that, uh, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway part of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's a bonus bet back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. You can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drain. Not too many threes coming from the Miami side of things, so maybe you can bet whether or not they'll hit over 10 three-pointers next game. I wouldn't count on it. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay, so don't miss a chance to get your no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Locked on Heat is available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, so please do subscribe. Well, David, that smelly smell you smell is the smell of another smelly loss. It's time to hand out. Some blame pie. I thought it was just the locker rooms, but you're right. It's probably the blame pie. <laughs> it doesn't smell great. Um, all right. Where to begin? I know. Uh, all right. I've got go an idea. It. Yeah, go for it. Tyler Hero. Okay. Uh, that is... 4 of 15 tonight, 1 of 5 from three-point range, had a couple of turnovers, did have six assists. He was a minus eight, total just 11 points. His backcourt partner wasn't uh, any better, really. Uh, in fact, it might have been worse in some degrees because he had such a good game against Philadelphia. That's Gabe Vincent we're talking about. But Tyler, the shots weren't falling. He was making bad passes, throwing his hands up in the air as of questioning why is everything going wrong and you know not looking necessarily in the mirror. A frustrating night for him. I think we've been pretty supportive of Tyler in general and his season-long struggles and inconsistencies. When he wasn't shooting the ball well, we pointed out, well, you know what? His playmaking has taken a significant leap. Yeah. Now yep. we can't even make that point. It, he just seems like he is not functioning at all within that starting lineup. And... Ira Winderman of the Sun Sentinel asking Eric Spolster whether or not it was time or has, has the ship sailed basically regarding any kind of major lineup change or anything else like that. I'm ready to bring it back up again. I think it's time for Tyler to, Tyler to go back to the bench. I don't think it's going to happen, but I think it's time to at least entertain that idea. Salary be damned. It doesn't really matter. He stunk out there. He was horrific. It was just the shots weren't falling. They were flat. That stupid floater, the hesitation that you talked about on the perimeter, everything going wrong there. None of it looked like the cocky player that we've seen over the first three seasons of an NBA career that looked so promising, that earned him the contract extension that kicks in next year. He just looks like a shell of himself, and I'm not exactly sure how to explain it, but it was a really, really ugly performance from Tyler Hero. I think think he gets at least... Six slices out of ten of blame putt. And that might be generous, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right. Well, I think you feel strongly about this than I do. I think I've gotten a reputation on this show for kind of being a Tyler, Tyler Hero apologist. <laughs> uh, and, and so I recognize that maybe I have a bias going into this thing. But um, in terms of the blame pie, we'll get there because I think there's a lot to hand out. Gabe Vincent was also 0 of 7 from three-point range. Max Struess was 2 of 7. And that was a good night compared to the other players on the Miami Heat. Uh, Victor Oladipo wasn't any good. I just, in terms of the three point shooting, it falls to Tyler Hero, Gabe Vincent, and Max Struess. Sure. Those three combined were three of 19. Uh, very, very bad. That was pretty good, right? Impressed yeah, by the math? Yeah, that was right? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, three of 19. You're just, like, you're not going to win games when you're not making shots. Yeah, Tyler Hero, it's, it's, it's a problem, okay? I think in the terms of sending him between the... Max and, and Gabe, though, is that the expectation for Tyler and the opportunities for yes. Tyler are greater. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I, I kind of look at Tyler's game, and I'm like, yeah, he led the team with 15 shots, and you could be like, well, why, why? is he shooting so much? Yeah, why? 
I kind of like that he took the 15 shots. At least oh. somebody's out here trying to do something. I suppose. And, and like everybody else just seems scared. And, and the one thing about Tyler Hero is he, does, he never oh. seems scared. And if I'm going to trust any one of these players, and yeah, I, I have an issue with him passing up open threes to dribble into traffic and things like that. Yes. Sometimes you'd actually maybe want him to be a little bit more scared. Yes. But I, if there's anybody on this roster who I trust to sort of break out and actually start putting together some good three-point shooting games, it's Tyler Hero. It's not Gabe Vincent. Why. It's not Max Struess. But I don't see why. I guess. I, look, I, he's catching the ball on the perimeter. He's taking that hesitation dribble instead of just letting it fly right away. And, I, again, we've seen the Heat drill this, though, and them say, hey, you need to take quicker decisions. And then he'll have like a week, two weeks where he is doing that. And so we've seen sort of the beta testing behind it work. But I, I don't know what necessarily has gone on recently that's kind of – maybe it's just sort of a, a situational issue. Like, hey, nothing's going on. Somebody's got to save the offense, and I'm Tyler Hero, so I'm going to do it. I don't know what it is. But you're, to your point, he did not have a good game. I'm not saying he should not get any blame pie. No, without But a I also look at, well, let's have that conversation about sending him back to the bench. For who, I guess, is my question. Because nobody else has been any better, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, certainly a good point. Um, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I think... Like, Struess can't be in the starting lineup. Max Struess missed a wide-open shot at the basket. And as soon as that happened, Pat Riley got up out of his chair and left the arena. And there was, like, six minutes left in the game. And the game was already over, and I almost left the arena. But I, it's just... Struess no, has right. not been good. Gabe Vincent, these last few games, in his last four games, after that hot start that he had when he was filling in for Kyle Lowry as a starter, his last four games as a starter... Eight of 33 from three-point range. I, I know we're, we're on opposite end of the spectrum there. You're being too much of an apologist, and I'm probably being way too reactionary, and that's fair. I'll cop to it. I know I, I saw that performance, and, and even on uh, a notoriously unbiased press row, I kept throwing my hands up in frustration <laughs> every time he took one of those ridiculous floaters yeah. that fell a foot or two short. I, 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 everything clanking off the rim, and I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know if he's just exhausted mentally, physically, or combination of two. I would have rejected the invitation to the three-point shootout so I could take that week off because it looks <laughs> like he absolutely needs it. Is there anybody else that needs Blaine Pie before we start divvying out the specific No, those three here? players that you mentioned. Yeah, that's I think fine. Tyler, Gabe, and Max. All right, you want to give, uh, let's do five to Tyler, three to Gabe, two to Struess, because at least Struess made, I don't know. <laughs> what two, did he three. make? He made two three pointers. I guess that's something. Uh, he also almost fouled out in the game, but whatever. Uh, fouled out? Almost, I said. He had 30 five. minutes, yeah. Yeah, he had five fouls in 30 minutes. Um, oh, picked up a technical, too. Hey, is you know there, what? He's, at least he's that's some fire, too, right? He threw yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, lose a different way. Like, at least lose the game on a bad technical at the end of the game or something. Like, this just was not a fun game to watch. I want to go back to that scoreless. Uh, this was a bad Kevin Love game, and I'm not going to give him any blame pie because he gets a little bit of a buffer here, I guess. That we're, I'm, I'm making up this rule right now. You get a, you get a week-long buffer of blame pie. After you get signed to the team midseason, because it's tough. Well, at least the offense is a little bit better. He airballed two shots. <laughs> he had a, and <laughs> and he had a twenty four second violation in the second quarter. He you called out the offensive foul that you found perplexing late in the game when the Heat were on that nine zero run, or they were on a run and then they gave up a nine zero run after that after that foul call. I don't know. Well, I, I mentioned I have, to you before we started recording. Not now. There was we oh, had cut okay. the lead down to eleven. And then there was a an offensive foul call on Kevin Love, and that seemed like they killed the momentum completely. Yeah, so some people had an issue with the foul call, but the foul call got called. I'm not, you know me, I, I hate yeah, complaining about refs. It's bad radio, but it happened, and that killed the momentum, and that and Kevin Love was involved in that uh, predicament. So it's a, it was a tough Kevin Love game. Um, I just there was there that I can't get over that six minute stretch of just not making a field goal like. Mm. A field goal. We, I, I, I've kind of gotten like zeroed in on the three point shooting, but like the offense overall was terrible tonight. Yeah. Uh, outside after that first quarter, there was a series in that second quarter again during that six minute stretch of not making a field goal where Tyler Hero and Victor Oladipo just passed the ball back and forth, mm. thirty feet away from the basket, yeah. just passed it back and forth, and then finally, uh, I forget who did it, but one of the 76ers was like. Okay, you're just going to throw this ball back and forth. I'm just going to take it, I'll and take then he it, yeah. did, and then scored in transition. Um, and I, this was, you said it earlier. Now I don't remember if it was before we started recording or during us recording, but it just didn't look like a Miami Heat team. This was, to me, the worst offensive performance of of the season. When you take everything in totality, how good you felt coming off of that Monday game in Philly, and the fact that you're adding Kevin Love and Cody Zeller and things seem to have been clicking a little bit with those two new guys in the mix. And, and it's just 
this th there was absolutely no plan and Spo after the game said they're just not doing it with intention and they got to do they got to create offense with intention they got to be intentional with what they're trying to get to every single play over and over and over again and that's a direct quote from Spo and and they just don't and and I don't know really if there's an answer for that it's what we're going to talk about next here on locked on heat could have and plus could a poor homestand lead the heat to maybe blow things up this summer that's coming up next Reach Locked on Heat on Twitter, Instagram, email us, LockedOnHeat at gmail.com. Uh, we're going to get to our listener questions here in a second, but I want to go back to what we talked about before the break there, David. Is there anything that this Heat team can do uh, to to fix their offense? Because Spo said that the answers are in the locker room, yeah. and I'm starting to doubt that the answers are in the locker room. Well, it kind of harkens back to what I was getting at before, right? That there's just a, a psychological issue there in terms of, like, they have to be able to execute better. They have to be able to understand what's at stake. They have to be able to take their game to that next level. What we saw on Monday, that part of what was so encouraging about Monday was recognizing the challenge of you're going into one of the best three teams in the Eastern Conference. You've just lost four straight. You're going up against an MVP-type player, Joel Embiid, and you recognize you have to stop the losing and continue building on something positive for the last 21 games of the season – and then you kind of have this incredible setback tonight, too. So I, 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 I look, maybe, again, you don't want to look at NBA players and, and wonder about the psychological issues. But, you know, maybe that manifests in different ways. Are there locker room issues? Is there a disharmony in this team? Is there a disconnect between that other? The vibes are not great right now. And I know that we talked about after the acquisition of Kevin Love in the practice right before his first game that there were positive vibes there, that there, there was an infusion of energy. And and this isn't anybody one player in particular, yeah. but right now it just seems like on the floor they just don't seem to know what to do with one another out there. And that's problematic, especially as you're entering the last 20 games of the regular season. Smolstra led teams have always seemed to figure it out more effectively as the season goes on. They improve over the course of the season. This team seems like it's taking a step back in some degree. I just don't know what there is to figure out. I mean, we could talk about moving with intention and, and playing offense in that way all we want, whatever it is. But I just don't think that the, the, this team is very good. I, like. Kevin Love was out of the rotation in Cleveland, and it wasn't some big conspiracy against Kevin Love. And now he's starting for the Miami Heat. I mean, that's kind of where this Heat team is at, you know? And that's fair. I, 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 you look at this group, and they've got two guys who are physical mismatches. They've got Jimmy Butler and they've got Bam Adebayo. And they're physical mismatches in that they can attack a defense, get the switch that they want, and get to their spot. They're not physical mismatches the way that Giannis or Joel Embiid are, where they're dominant top five players in the NBA, but they are physical mismatches. Um, that's the end of the list. That's it. And when you talk about even, like, speed, like, there's not anybody, like, that's fast. Tyler Hero is their best guard. He, he creates space with skill, but in terms of his physicality, no, like, flat. even, like, Tyrese Maxey, he'll just create a mismatch with his speed. You get a guy, a slow-footed big on him, he's... Most he's toast, like he's done. We saw that with Kevin Love tonight, and that's not even a Kevin Love problem. We saw it with Cody Zeller tonight. That's not even a Cody Zeller problem. That's just they're big and slow, and Tyrese Maxey is small and and one of the fastest players in the NBA. So the Heat just don't have that many guys who are physical mismatches. And when I go back to the shooting part of this thing, I, I, a lot of people could say, well, isn't that just the NBA these days? If you if you make your threes, then you win, and if you don't make your threes, then you lose. And that is mostly true. But there are teams like Philly and like. Milwaukee and these other teams that have these physical mismatches, uh, whatever team Kevin Durant happens to be on, like that say, okay, this guy's just going to will their team or, or just, you know, win games for their team because they're just such ridiculous mis historic mismatches that there's nothing you could do against it. For the Heat, everything that Jimmy and Bam does is to create that three-point shooting, and all that three-point shooting does is create more space for Jimmy and Bam to work. So it's a symbiotic relationship that existed last year. And then last year, you see how it works when they're the best three-point shooting team in the league. It sets up Jimmy Butler for success. It sets up Bam Adebayo for success. The team has the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. They make it all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals, and guess what? The vibes were awesome with that team because they were winning. The vibes are not awesome with this team because they're losing. It's not rocket science. I don't think it's a... a a locker room issue necessarily. I don't think there's some sort of guy in the locker room causing problems. I just think that this team stinks and they're losing games and losing sucks and that and this team doesn't feel like 
feel like good about losing. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it even as we're talking about it right now. And, and, and as you're describing all these things regarding physical mismatches, it kind of boils down back to roster construction. That yes. You don't have any elite level athletes on this team. And that you've built, you know, this group with too many undrafted players that were probably undrafted because of that lack of athleticism, et cetera. Yep. Basically, your only superstar athlete, as you said, Jimmy, Bam, and maybe Caleb Martin to some degree there. Sure. But you're not expecting that same kind of overpowering performance from him. But I can't separate the fact that this was basically the same roster as last year, and it was still good enough. And I know that we've talked about it before, the lack of a scouting report on Gabe, Max, et cetera, that you were still getting some more production from Duncan that you're not getting this year that, at it, all. It's, it, that's a good. It, that's the part that I can't figure out is why so many guys who shot so well last year aren't shooting well this year. That part of it, I don't have an answer to. But I don't think anybody does, and I no, don't think they do too. And I just, I, I don't think that you could bring this roster back next year the way that it is and expect it to be what it was two years ago at that point versus what it is this year. Um, and well, that kind of brings us to our next question. Name yeah. pa- Napalm Death number 13, uh, aptly named Twitter handle, wants to, who wants to blow things up. Is it finally time to reset? This homestand will bring horrendous results, I think. Miami will get booted out after a game in the play-in if they even get there. The Heat are going to make the play-in tournament, all right? They're going to do that. But um, You make that sound like it's a done deal. I mean, it's not they'll officially it done, but they'll make the play-in tournament. I, I still haven't lost uh, any confidence, I, or I shouldn't say confidence. I still haven't lost hope that this Heat team can make the playoffs as the number six seed because also what happened tonight was the Brooklyn Nets, who really stink, lost the Knicks by like 30 points. The race to the and bottom. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so they still, the Heat, despite losing this game, are still two games in the loss column behind the Brooklyn Nets for that six seed. So it's still possible. But it's a tough way to start this homestand with this loss. This should have been a win. Should have. No buts about it. Uh, and then these games coming up, you got one against the Knicks, who are rolling right now. You got two games against the Hawks, who are kind of newish and kind of dangerous in that way. And then you got two games against the Cavaliers, who are really good. So this is going to get tough. So if Napalm's question here, if this homestand does bring horrendous results, I've said this before the homestand. This is the make or break stretch for the Heat season. If you, if you don't go at least 500 and probably better on this homestand, you're, you're in a really tough spot to make the playoffs, and it'll be down to the play-in tournament, and then maybe you make the playoffs, and then who knows what happens. But in terms of getting one of those top six seeds, if you go anything worse than 500 on this homestand, that's pretty much out the window. Like it, you're, It's not happening. So let's talk about it. Uh, but no blow-up is going to take place this season. It's too late for that. We, no, no, this summer. Let's talk about this summer. Oh, this summer? Yeah. Oh, no. I'm at that point now. And, and I, again, I... I I don't know what the answer is, and I hate talking about people that I've talked to in a locker room that I've seen that I enjoy covering for the most part, except when they're out on the, on the hardwood floor. Having said that, this team absolutely needs a change. It's just not working. I, whatever worked last year, I don't know if Jimmy Butler, as good as he has been, and as much as we keep thinking, I'm guilty of it. I, I've talked about it. This is in the last episode that all season long, there's always the expectation of the, ne- the next step, the next area for improvement, the next hope waiting in the wings. Well, there's no more hope. And for me, the next step is, you know, play off Jimmy. He's going to take this group and somehow put it all together and carry them past the play-in tournament, past the, the, uh, the first round of the playoffs, and who knows how deep they can go. I'm no longer as confident as I was. Wow. And, and this I is think the most dejected I've heard you all season. I'm more realistic. I just watched this team, and again, after seeing them reach a high point on Monday and then crap the bed so completely two days later, I just I don't understand it. And uh, I, They're I, not a good team. I criticize Tyler Hero. It's not just on him. It's on everybody, and, and that includes Jimmy. That includes Bam, who I think are still going to be on this roster moving forward. I don't think any – there's no way that those two players are getting traded, but everybody else not named Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo – should probably be included in a trade. And I'm not sure what it will yield, uh, and I'm not sure what player you can get in return, but it seems apparent that a change is necessary. I think Bam Adebayo is the only untouchable player on this roster. I can't I'll put it that way. Okay. I mean, look. I- uh, look, the, the Heat, they can't bring this team back, but it's going to be very hard not to bring this team back because they're going to be operating without any cap space next year. You've got uh, the extension for Jimmy Butler kicking in. You've got the extension for Tyler Hero kicking in. Bam Adebayo is getting paid. Lowry, Duncan Robinson, those contracts are still on the books for next season. And so you look at who they could bring back, and 
the only way to get basically above minimum players is with the mid-level exception that they still have and that they will be able to use for this, this offseason. So you'll have the mid-level exception, maybe bring in a difference maker. You might have to give that to Kevin Love if you want to bring him back, unless he's willing to come back from the minimum, which I doubt. Uh, that's, that's an option. Uh, Cody Zeller, same thing for him. And then in terms of your own free agents, like Max Struess, Caleb Martin, uh, Omer Yurtsevin. Omer Yurtsevin is a restricted free agent, but it's like, okay, if you let those guys walk, who are you replacing them with? You're replacing them with minimum-level players. I'm not saying that they should not do that, but I'm also saying like the the ways to improve this team are not like out there. Like you don't just like let these guys walk and then go out and sign some great free agents. Like you're you're gonna let these guys walk and then basically replace them with similar with level similarly level players. So and that look, they'll probably have to do that at the very least. And that's just something different because sure. you can't bring back the roster as, the way it is now, but you've also poured all these resources into guys like Gabe Vincent and Max Struess, and then just to let them walk away for nothing for some sort of minimum player who you, you know nothing about, it's, that's also, it'll be a tough decision for the Strauss to make. You just can't overpay them. I think they've learned that Duncan You Robinson can't overpay them, yeah. And I, look, I don't know who's overpaying for Struess or, or Vin, Gabe Vincent even at this point. but um, Don't compete against yourself, though, in right. terms of what you offer them. You know, you, you lowball them. Lowball them. You want to walk, you get a better deal, have at it. Uh, Find it elsewhere. And the other part is that you have to try to clear off one of the contracts, at least, of Kyle Lowry and Duncan Robinson. And to do that, you might have to part with a draft pick, and the Heat don't want to do that. Uh, they didn't want to do it before the deadline. That's why Kyle Lowry is still on the team. And I, I don't know that they're going to want to do that this offseason. And if they do do it this offseason, then that's, a, that's desperation. They'll be more desperate this summer than they were last summer. So that's where we're getting to, though. If the Heat flame out in the play-in or the, or the first round of the playoffs or something like that, they have to make changes. Everybody knows that. I think they will make changes. But to make those changes, it's gonna. There's gonna be some pain in doing that, and it's not gonna be like wholesale changes. This team's all of a sudden better. It might be wholesale changes. This team takes a step back and 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 subtracts from their already limited, you know, pool of assets that they're that they're working with. That has limited what they can do in terms of making additions already. So, it's it's. It's not bleak because you still have two really great players in Bam Adebayo and Jimmy Butler on the roster, but to rebuild the roster around them is is in, in getting increasingly difficult. I don't know that it gets any easier, uh, and it's it's basically up to this front office to figure it out. But I'm, I'm looking at it, and I, I can't figure it out. No, I, I'll just say I think this, <laughs> this even the topic of conversation is probably one that we should address. In the offseason. You're right. I mean, it seems it, early. It's, it's one loss. But it's it is. Frustration. It is. But you and, he, you and I said this, and we can end the show here, but you and I said this after the Philly game on Monday. Is this something that we're going to see being sustained by the Miami Heat? And we were like, I don't know. It was the best win of the season. Who knows what it's going to be? And, and I just think that this is what it's going to be. The Heat are going to win enough games to make the play-in tournament. They could still yet win enough games to make the number six seed. But I've said this for months, David. This team's not good enough. It's just not good enough to reach the goals that this team sure. sets out for themselves. And when you understand that, and the front office knows that, and I do believe the front office knows that, and it's basically known that since July, you have to try to make some changes. And they're going and you know add Kevin Love, Kevin Love and Cody Zeller, and those are some changes. But it feels like more drastic changes are going to have to be made sooner rather than later. Will we turn it around if we beat the Knicks? Or I mean, if, if Miami beats the Knicks, will we be back on the optimism optimism train? I, we could feel good about where the team is and be optimistic. I still think that they could make the number six seed. I'm not saying that. No, but I'm no. also – I've not moved off the stance of They're wins, losses, enough. whatever. This team's not good enough. They're just not good enough. That's fair. Thanks again for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Remember to subscribe to new episodes of Locked on Heat on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Ring the bell to get notified as soon as new episodes go up. Now make your second listen Game to Game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result, Locked on Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked on can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked on NBA. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. David, thanks for joining me. Yeah, well, what choice do I have?